The next step in our adventure today is talking about recreational drugs and what they do to your brain. In other words, now that we put in all the work in thinking about all the different neurobiology of synaptic transmission, we can talk about how to hack it. So before we start, we're going to be talking about the molecular targets of recreational drugs. Here's a diagram of a chemical synapse that you've already seen many different times in the previous videos. If you want a review of the different steps of, of chemical synaptic transmission, please review those, those, um, those videos now. But once you've figured out what all of these molecules are, perhaps it will not surprise you that every single one of them is a molecular target of recreational drugs. Before we start and dig into each of these, I want to say a disclaimer up front to please not alter your pattern of prescription drug compliance as a result of anything you see in this video. We're talking about fun neurobiology. Please don't make any decisions based on it. And please consult a medical care professional for further guidance about your prescription drugs. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about drugs. All right, so these are the drugs that we're gonna be talking about today. Morphine, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, ethanol, which is an alcohol that we drink, caffeine, which I am currently on right now, which is why I'm talking so fast, phencyclidine, PCP, LSC, lysergic acid diethylamide, which is a hallucinogen, nicotine, which is found in uh, cigarettes, cocaine, found in cocaine, and amphetamines, which is uh, a class of molecules that are also known as speed. All right, so that's the, <laughs> that's the plan. We're gonna talk about all of these today. First, but for drugs to get into your blood, it has to cross what's called the stomach to blood barrier, which is in the lipid membrane, just like every other um, barrier in, in your body. And so there's a story here that is actually a story of chemistry. And we'll be talking about a couple of different biochemistry and organic chemistry stories today in this drug section. And the story goes the following. The cocaine in its native form is actually a salt, cocaine hydrochloride. And in order for cocaine hydrochloride, because it's a charged particle, to pass through the lipid, my, lipid barrier into your blood, it actually has to become a slightly different form. And that is why chewing cocoa leaves with lime basically takes cocaine hydrochloride into cocaine base, otherwise known as crack cocaine, and that has a much easier time of passing through from the stomach to blood barrier and into your blood. Um, so if you were wondering why crack cocaine is so much more effective than cocaine and chewing cocoa leaves also makes cocaine more effective, this piece of chemistry is what explains that observation. Going back to the molecular targets of recreational drug, and now that you're in the blood, now that you're in the brain, where are we going next? Well, let's, take the, let's take the tour here. The THCs and morphines and nicotines and all of these different recreational drugs we're talking about, a large number of them are actually um, found in nature. They're distillates for plants. And so they've been known to human history and natural history for a very long time. People have used different uh, versions of these chemicals, both medicinally as, as well as recreationally for, for a long time. And a lot of these molecules are actually really important in the cultural histories of lots of different cultures. There's some of them, though, that are actually synthetics. So amphetamine is a synthetic, PCP is a synthetic molecule, MDMA is also a synthetic molecule. And so they didn't really exist before the modern era when we actually had organic chemistry. So to talk about drugs of abuse uh, and also recreational drugs, we have to talk about the pleasure reward system. So far in these lectures, we haven't talked too much about the different parts of the brain and what they do. That's more the focus of the next set of lecture videos that we'll be talking about. But I'm just gonna give you a preview here because it's really fascinating to get you a preview of not only the different molecules that are involved, but also the different molecular systems that are involved in different parts of your brain. So the pleasure reward system is a really powerful one in your brain. This is a picture of a uh, what's called a sagittal section, and in this particular case, it's a rat brain, but there's a very similar version of this for a human brain. A sagittal section is basically a side view where I'm cutting my, my head in half kind of this way, so I'm seeing the left and the right half of the brain separately. So what you're seeing here is a sagittal view of the rat brain. The left is the front, the right hand is back, and so the spine and the rest of the rat's going to go back that way. All right? The pleasure reward system involves a couple of key areas. It includes what's called the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, and the VTA, the ventral tegmental area. And it is a large set of systems that, um, that, that tell you when you've done something right and you want a reward and, and also gives you a feeling of dread and unpleasantness when you do something that you don't want to do next time. In particular, the information about pleasure and reward is carried through a large nerve bundle 
that crosses the medial prefrontal cortex, the nuclear accumbens, and the VTA, the, the ventral tegmental area, in what's called the, more, the medial forebrain bundle. This is literally the wire that carries all sense of pleasure in your brain. So, to give you an idea of how powerful the system is, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of what happens for the medial forebrain bundle. If you tapped into the medial forebrain bundle, this is a nerve bundle here, so it's a bunch of axons that are electrically active, you can build yourself a robo-rat. So, in this paper, what they did is uh, they implanted an electrical device that directly stimulated by passing current through the medial forebrain bundle of my little rat down there. It's carrying a backpack, so it has a battery attached to it. And um, when it stimulates the more medial forebrain bundle, the rat feels like, ooh, something good, I'm gonna go forward. And then they also implanted two other wires, one corresponding to the part of the brain for the left whiskers, and one corresponding to the part of the brain for the right whiskers. That's if something was, uh, was touching the rat on the left side or the right hand side. So now you have a robo rat because you have three buttons. One of them makes it go forward, the other one makes it go left, and the other one makes it go right. And so here's a couple of demonstrations where without training, by pressing those buttons of which ones we're simulating, medial forebrain bundle, the left whisker, whisker cortex, or right whisker cortex, the rat was able to navigate this relatively complicated set of mazes without training just by being stimulated in the correct places, correct respective places in its brain. So that's cool. Uh, but it's actually a little distressing as well. There's what's called a set of drug self-administration experiments that have also been done with rats, where the, dr uh, the, the, the rat is given the option of having either food or a direct simulation to its medial forebrain bundle. So it has a choice. It can either eat food or uh, get a simulation directly in its medial forebrain bundle. So it can either have cake or not real cake. Distressingly, in the majority of the experiments, because the simulation of the medial forebrain bundle is so pleasurable, oftentimes the rat would keep pressing that button to simulate the medial forebrain bundle and starve to death. So that is how powerful the system is. The reason it's so powerful is because it reflects unexpected reward. In other words, this is the part of the brain that becomes active when something good happens and you weren't expecting it which is you know, the unexpected pleasure of good things happening, right? Um, not only do the part of your brain called the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, reflect this type of unexpected reward, individual dopamine cells also can reflect unexpected reward. And that is the basis of amphetamines and cocaine. So the dopamine system is the target of cocaine, where the cocaine is an antagonist of the dopamine reuptake transporter. Let's unpack that for a little bit. Your dopamine cell, and when dopamine is released, it is one of the ways that the body codes for the fact that there is a pleasure and unexpected reward. Cocaine, because it is an antagonist, shuts down, the dopamine reuptake transporter, it means that cocaine makes it so that the dopamine is not leaving the synaptic cleft. It would normally be taken up by these transporters and get recycled and get removed from the synaptic cleft. But because there's cocaine, it's an antagonist which blocks the dopamine reuptake, reuptake transporters. Effectively, we have more dopamine because every molecule of dopamine that the dopamine cells release sticks around for longer. And that explains one of the reasons why cocaine is so pleasurable and also so addictive. Similarly, amphetamines targets a different transporter system. Instead of targeting the dopamine reuptake transporter system, it targets the vesicular transport system for dopamine and serotonin. So what that's basically going to mean is that it's actually an antagonist in that it's a false substrate. So amphetamines makes it so that instead of packing more dopamine and serotonin back into those vesicles, it's packing amphetamines into those vesicles instead, and amphetamines don't really do anything when you release them. And this increases the local presynaptic um, uh, uh, pre terminal concentrations of dopamine and serotonin in these cells. Um, there's a little more complicated explanation of why this actually leads to the stimulant effects of amphetamines, but this is known to be one of the molecular targets of amphetamines. 
We also already talked a little bit about not only the dopamine system, but the serotonergic system. The serotonergic system is, uh, is related to the dopamine system, but anatomically it's a little bit distinct. So instead of having to do with the nucleocumbens and the VTA, the ventral area, now we're talking about a series of brain structures that are collectively known as the raphi nuclei in this part of the brain. We are once again looking at a sagittal section of the brain. This happens to be a human brain rather than the rat brain. So it's more like what your brain and my brain looks like. And the serotonin cells live, their cell body are in the raphe nuclei, but then they project through their axons all over the brain. This does not go to one place. It basically goes everywhere. One analogy that I heard of in describing the serotonergic system of the brain is that it's more like a um, it's more like a sprinkler system where you have these you have these little sprinklers of serotonin that just kind of go all over and so it's a slower acting more of a neuromodulatory effect rather than glutamate or GABA that turns things on and off kind of rapidly. So that's kind of what serotonin does. The serotonin system is the target of hallucinogens, including PCP and LSD and psilocybin. So PCP is an antagonist of the NADA glutamine receptors of the serotonergic system. LSD and psilocybin instead target the metabotropic receptors of the 5-HT receptors. 5-HT is another, word, uh, another way of saying serotonin, so it's an agonist of the serotonin receptors. Think about what that happens. Let's unpack that for a little bit. I know it's a lot of words, a lot of jargon. Let's unpack that for a little bit. Serotonin receptors cause feelings of pleasure, for example, and connection. LSD and psilocybin activate those same serotonin receptors so that the action of serotonin is mimicked by taking these hallucinogens. Right, so here we have examples of two different types of hallucinogens that target the metabotropic receptors as well as the ionotropic receptors of the serotonin system. We can look at other types of psychedelics, right? So it's not just the uh, postsynaptic receptors that are targets of these recreational drugs. Psychedelics like MDMA is an antagonist or false substrate of the serotonin reuptake, transmitter, uh, reuptake transporters, just like dopamine reuptake transporters are blocked by cocaine. MDMA blocks the reuptake of serotonin. This causes a net serotonin efflux. There's more serotonin coming out. In large concentrations, though, beware because it has been documented that MDMA can be neurotoxic and lead to serotonin cell death. Um, you do not want your serotonin cells to die. Okay. At a global level, we talked a lot about molecular targets of these recreational drugs. At a global level, there's actually a really vibrant field now of neuroscientists studying at a holistic systems level what happens when your brain is on various types of, uh, of hallucinogens. Here's an earlier study of comparing what your brain activation looks like when you're not an LSD and when you are an LSD. I'm just gonna read here a quote from one of the authors. Normally, our brain consists of independent networks that perform separate specialized functions. Nice. Your visual system and your auditory system and your motor system are somewhat distinct. But under LSD, the separateness of these networks breaks down and instead you see a more integrated or unified brain. So from a brain imaging level, this is the kind of thing that we might see when, uh, at, at a more systems level once again, rather than at a molecular level, what happens under the influence of LSD. There's also more, a little more, it, we talked mostly about uh, serotonin and dopamine and glutamate, right? These are common neuro, neuro neurotransmitters. There's a couple of more uncommon neurotransmitters that are targets of, of, of recreational drugs. So caffeine targets, again, metabotropic receptors. And in this case, it's an antagonist of GPCRs whose endogenous ligand is adenosine. So adenosine is another neurotransmitter we haven't talked about, but it is the target of caffeine, okay? THC is an agonist of CB1 receptors, which are, not surprisingly, GPCRs, and their endogenous ligands is uh, adametamide. THC is but a single example of a large class of cannabinoid molecules. So uh, ones that you may have heard about include tetra tetrahydrocannabinol THC as well as CBD cannabidiol. But in reality, there's actually hundreds of these cannabinoid family of compounds that would be found naturally in different cannabis plants. And they are accompanied by a correspondingly complex array of cannab cannabinoid receptors in your brain. So depending on the specific mixture of compounds and the specific mixture of receptors that are listening to it, you can get a host of various effects by taking cannabinoid, recept uh, cannabinoid family of compounds into your nervous system. 
So it's a short summary. Don't take this too literally. This is like, a, it's like an attempt at oversimplifying some very, very complicated things. These are some of the drugs of recreation that we talked about, as well as which of the systems that they affect. So we have the dopamine pleasure system, emphasis on the quotes. There's a noradrenaline readiness system. There's a perception association system, which is a little more hand wavy. And then there are ones that kind of just generally decrease neuronal activity. Ethanol actually falls in this category. It is a very small molecule, right? So ethanol is two carbons and an OH group and a couple of uh, hydrogens. And so unlike all of these other molecules, it doesn't really, it's not very specific. It has a generalized effect on your nervous system. And so one of the things that it does, is it generally decreases neuronal activity. That's one of the things that it does. So. That is our whirlwind tour of the molecular targets of recreational drugs. I hope this gives you some insights into the different steps of synaptic transmission, as well as different ways that they can be modulated to have very complex effects that manifest in sometimes interesting ways in your nervous system.